the connection there. So I'm going to be on board with you guys and, and dealing with the family members a little bit longer in this in this program, thinking about a lot of the stuff that we did. And that's some of the stuff we realize when you come into the Saints organization. And uh, I'm sorry about that family. The uh, We're having some issues with the rain that dropped us, that dropped out. So we back at it, though, family again. And I'm uh, going to wait till some of the family members chime a little bit more in. But sorry about that, family. Rain, rain, go away. The rain dropped in on us and uh, knocked our stream out. So we are experiencing some very rainy weather and lightning outside and everything it won't stop us from talking saints so i'm sorry about that family from dropping out on y'all strictly a weather situation interrupting our signal but we're back at it we're fine we're running it and we're still talking about it a lot of stuff that i realized man from what the saints are doing is planning really smart planning really smart now covering a lot of stuff from the nfl today uh, a lot of suspect thinking about the fact that the NFL season won't continue. I'm telling you straight up, family, is that the NFL season will move forward. We're getting conflict and information, but the NFL has dropped this schedule. It's going to go ahead, and it does have contingencies in place. Have is how it's separating its ball games for just if something were to happen, that they can then slide games to the later portion of the season or what have you, being at the kind of climate that the team is playing in. But you got to remember over everything that we've been through and there's no such, you know, it's not been a very peaceful time in the hundred something years the NFL has been playing football or having its football league. There's been several wars that's been happened since the NFL's a hundred year old league, for goodness sakes. And uh, very rarely does it suspend its seasons. And we've went through uh, situations where they've had really terrible things that occurred wars and everything like that there and they still were able to get it together now this is just something a little differently but still in all i still anticipate them playing games even if it's without a without the fans in the stands as some of these uh, supposed doctors are on television telling you that you can have the games just don't have uh the fans there because un un unless everybody gets uh tested which is something that they're pushing. And I think a lot of the Players Association guys are agreeing to that. They're agreeing to the testing. And that's, I think, is that's expediting the process in terms of people getting onto the field and taking care of business. So that's something to, to think about as well moving forward uh, into the NFL season. As far as the Saints are concerned, they're doing the same thing. They're preparing. A lot of the stuff that they're doing is virtual as well. And letting, letting players know to stay uh, to stay to get in shape, stay in shape, you know, stay in shape, do what you got to do to be ready when the time comes. And then when the time comes, they'll have a series of instructions to let people know exactly what's the next step. And, and it, this is definitely unprecedented, unprecedented times, man, that we're living in to see if they could do this. Cause the, the NBA is totally turned around. They don't know what the hell they doing. They don't know what the hell they doing. You know, and, and the NFL's operating like, okay, we full speed. We're doing this. We're doing that. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then the, NF, the NBA is like, <laughs> they still not where it is. I'm like, man, why, you know, it's just really, you know, kind of strange how one organization know what they're doing. The other one just, you know, they just turned around. But thank for a lot of the family members for rejoining the stream. Of course, like I said, we dropped out uh, the last time uh, through the internet issues, but I, I'm just kicking it with the family on this night. I won't be with you guys for a very long time tonight. We're just going to talk a little bit, questions, answers in the forum or whatnot, and then we're going to move on. But let me hit the chat up. Uh, let's see. Uh, Debo says, I was going to say we could have started a lot of guards the past few years due to production. All linemen got Pro Bowl nods, and that's, a, that's, and that's true. And that's due to the fact that we've had some great instruction from the offensive line coaches. They've done a terrific job, man. They've really have with our, with our O linemen. They've done that in the D linemen as well. We've had some solid play from guys up front on the O and defensive line. We just need to turn up the sack, the sacks on those on the defensive line because we already ranked, according to 2019 stats, as the fourth best against stopping your ass from running the ball. Now, if you could just add that with 
the pressure aspect and be able to get sacks on top of the fact that we stop you from running the ball, then you can have some. And then that'll make your secondary look a hell of a lot better as well, being that, guess what? You know, I, the quarterback doesn't have any breathing room to stand back there and get comfortable. So that's something to take into consideration. Trey Joseph, who that to you, says, do you think our team will still have an edge without our greatest weapon, the black and gold nation? That is a very fair question, Trey. To not have the fans in the stands for the games, that eliminates the element of, I mean, that el totally elim eliminates the element of home field advantage. You know, it, it just, it's just, it's just unnatural not to have the fans in the stands during the games. And of course, I know probably they're going to simulate uh, crowd noise, but when you're in somebody else's arena, you're going to simulate the crowd noise in their advantage or keep it fair the whole way. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> it just changes everything. It's just totally changes everything. Cause the game takes a lesser in a lesser feel when you're not there. And I've often, I kept saying that, and that's not just the fact that your presence is not there. It's that you are the lifeblood of these things. You are the lifeblood. Is your money, your passion, your determination, your energy is the thing that makes it all worthwhile. But if you're not there, it's dull, it's boring, it's just a bunch of guys running around. It's it's basically scrimmage. It's gonna be scrimmage time, you know, and well, I mean, it, like I said, and people saying, will it get back to normal and get back to normal? No, it won't get back to normal. That's the truth. That's why it's, that's why it's such a thing as an Overton window, which incrementally you used to be over here in, in, in moral perspective. And then slowly but surely you was moved over here. And then you go back and say, how did I go from there to there? Because that's how it happens. They'll create a new normal for you to get normal too. It's just what they will do. But it's up to you. It really is up to you and your thought process to understand how it work, how the world works and how to participate and not speculate. So, I mean, no, I don't think it'll get back to what you know as normal unless drastic things occur to get there. Uh, Willie Mitchell says, what up with everybody in the chat? What's good, Willie? Uh, Debo says, Pete is not a true pro bowler. Walford has been a dependable starter. True to the fact that, uh, well, you know, I'm Andrews Pete. Person, I think Andrews Pete had his troubles and his problems, no doubt about it. Pete has had his troubles and his problems, but you can't take his Pro Bowls away. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you might not like his ass, but you can never take his awards away because truth is told, they could have had several other players that could have got those awards. They drew, they picked Andrews Pete because they realized what he means to the team, and that's and that's the God honest truth. And you might not like him, but he's got those pro bowlers. Uh, Debo says the NFL is going to go because they don't want to lose a penny. No, they they not. Of course not. There are, are people in this world, uh, you know, capitalists that will continue to get it because they refuse to let the league. Because these are the same people that went played during times of war, when the Iraq war and all these other wars and all these other major events was going on in the world. They still had the league going, generating revenue. And this this would happen under pandemics. We might have not been having them here, but around the world during that time. This ain't the first one. You had the, Mer the, the MERS and the SARS and all this stuff was going on in other countries and people were traveling. And you had the Ebola breakout here. But people were still doing, but no suspending of the season. So if you look at it from a historical standpoint, people continue to still move around and go. The NFL will still have these games. They will still play these games. Even if the fan base is not there, they will still play these games. Uh, Stunner, T-B-O-T-B, -T -B, what up, family? Good to see you, Stunner. Uh, Stunner, uh, let me see. I got that right, T-B-O-T-B. -T -B. Yeah, I got that right. Uh, what up to you, fam? Uh, Debo says, Co uh, corporation choose money over lives. Sorry to say. Bottom line, man, you are a human resource. Some genius had the idea to call you a resource like oil, like any other resource you pull up out of the ground. And we was cool with that. Some kind of way we got cool with that. And it requires questioning who put the resource tag on top of your goddamn head and said that you're a resource that somebody could use just like anything else. It requires logic. It requires thinking. And some, some of this stuff is not even challenged. And that's a shame. 
uh Donna it's like it's like that's not that hasn't been challenged just like the terms third world and first world like third world where did that come from you know I know where it comes from but I'm saying most people don't know where that comes from they just use it without investigating the origins of such things and that's a shame because you're a fool if you do stuff like that you got to know where the stuff that you're saying comes from maybe it's inappropriate for you to be using it you know, if you if you look at the origins of it, you'll realize that a lot of it's nonsense. Uh, he said the 985 live. Who that says you heard that the NFL won't investigate this. The Tomlin envelope situation. The Saints always get messed over. Some people play ball with the NFL. It's something about the Saints. And like I told you all the last live stream or so, I believe is that the Saints got the Saints. Uh, the New Orleans you got the NFL franchise on the scandal. See, a lot of this stuff you have to research, and I'm a researching guy. And that's how they, <laughs> the, the, the Saints got the team from the NFL through a scandal. And I won't get into it. That's up to you to find out. But, yes, I see that the typical fashion, they haven't challenged the Patriots with anything. Everybody gets to beat out or get hand slaps, but the Saints, get they get really just knocked upon. And it's a shame. But you... <laughs> There's there's ways there's ways around this here stuff. Debo says the NBA are, are back tracing tracking because they want to make it moves fast. Boy, they really messing up a lot of time, boy. I, I just really saying where they leadership at. Either shut it down or do something, man. What you going to do about the NBA? Just just what I, my, my thought process. Do something or do nothing. <laughs> do something. Get your ass up and do something. Joshua says, Big Q, the Saints need to do what the Broncos did for man and get him the best possible, get him the best possible on the field so he can go out on top. He has earned it, and this is his last year. This is all or nothing. I like that, Josh. Hopefully, we only need a few things. I, I, I still say well, this is a pretty complete team. We just need, we just really need that extra edge rusher that can complement Cam Jordan. Maybe a veteran DB as well. And that kind of punctuates the Saints' really excellent offseason. You know, they weren't that far off last year. They weren't that far off last year or the year before that. They weren't that far off. And remember, and I've kept saying this over and over again, people can ask, keep asking around Q, why do they keep falling out of the joint the plus? How do they dominate the regular season? And then lose so poorly in the playoffs over the last three years. And that's due to the fact that the Saints are not a disciplined team when it comes down to playoff football. They aren't. Look how they looked last year in home against the Minnesota Vikings. Did they look like they took that game seriously? Where was the preparation and the mind state going into that game? The seriousness, the attention to detail, the the each person wins their matchup approach. And don't worry about all this. You just beat that guy in front of you. And I beat the guy and we will do it like that. Wasn't there. They were manhandled on both sides of the line. They created miscues that ultimately hurt their team. And that was the superstars and nine stars alike. Missed tackles, poor angles, bad calls. Uh, it was just a, my, a mishmash of terrible dysfunctionality on the field for the Saints. And it's happened over the last three years. And some people say, well, Q, the Rams game, we got cheated. No, if you would have caught the touchdown pass that drew through to uh, to uh, the tight end, you would have more than likely have won that game. That momentum would have moved you into a, a win over the Rams in that game. It was a bad no call, but what do you expect? You knew that whole time that the referees were dirty. And they didn't stop after being spotlighted that they were dirty because the the referees are mindless. They brainless. They brainless drones that's operated by the commissioner who himself is a puppet for the owners of the league. So what is the game plan when the commissioner who manipulates the referees who is manipulated by the owners? Then you start thinking on high or where what's going on here. But sometimes it's not football left on the field. Sometimes you have to take it over. And I've said that. That's how the Saints were able to win 13 games last year because when they needed to, they took the games out of the referee's hands. And they were able to win the game that way. The playoffs have to be the same mantra. There are very few teams that can play with the Saints offensively 
in, when they're balanced, when they're balanced and not trying to throw the ball all over the place, they could be a, a, a very talented juggernaut that very p- p- few people can deal with. So what's been happening? Miscues and non-disciplined football. That's what's been happening. It's not been teams that just been better than the Saints. The Saints didn't come to play against the Minnesota Vikings until the final four minutes of the game. And then 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 they couldn't even execute a two minute drive in the in the playoffs. They couldn't even muster up enough energy or passion or determination or state of emergency to be able or urgency to be able to do something in that game. And that's telling. That is very telling. That is telling because don't tell me, please don't tell me you the type of person that's good enough to get there, but not good enough to get through. And I don't think that way, but I'm saying your patterns, your behavior would dictate what people think about you. They're not going to think about you in a positive light if you're doing negative things. That's just that. That's just stupid. You got to be either a fool or a moron to think something of somebody that you know have a track record of disagreeableness and then assuming that sooner or later they're going to be no anybody can change their stripes but it's up to that person to then show based on the actions not what they say you can say any goddamn thing what does your action your action say what is what movements are you making that determine what the outcome would be and that's what it's about and that applies across every and any spectrum sports included uh, Debo says, <clears throat> Dwight, what up, Dwight? He says, everybody can play with respirators. <laughs> Dwight says, everybody can play with respirators on. There you go, bro. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, it sure would mean that you would have less tired players. I'll tell you what, wouldn't that be? Thank you for that. T-Dirty, what up, T-Dirty? What happened, baby? T-Dirty, who that for life in the building? Good to see your family. Uh, Joe Gidry, what up, Joe? Who that? T says, who that? You think the Saints uh, think highly of Mar- Marcus Callaway with his contract? No doubt about it. He pl- played, paid him ten thousand dollars more than they played Jawan Johnson, the wide receiver from Oregon. So they definitely like Callaway, just like they lo- they like Joe Beshi. They gave Joe Beshi the biggest contract this undrafted period out of all the undrafted guys. And remember last year, that guy who won the largest undrafted contract was Carl Granderson. The Saints paid Granderson the highest last year, Joe uh, uh, Joe Beshi that this year. But yes, Marquez Callaway is a guy that I would not be surprised that the team likes simply because the fact that he got good speed. He's six foot two, got has pretty decent speed, and he's a utility guy you could put in the kick return, punt return aspect. He has size and he brings speed to the equation. So he is definitely somebody that you can look at and say the Saints have a legitimate interest in him. What, he, what 85,000, I think it was, which is 10 more than Jawan Johnson. Yeah, that's, that, I would say that's, that is a good point there, Joe. Thank you for that. Pay attention, 26. Who that to your family? Good to see you in, in the, the chat. Javier, who that to you? He says, only sport that will last without fans is NASCAR. Other sports will last for so long. That's what I'm saying, you know. You're seeing boxing with nobody in the stands. You're seeing football when you see hundreds of thousands, you see hundreds of thousands of, well, thousands of seats. Some arenas are 80,000, some are 90,000, 70,000 seat arenas where people are yelling their head off. For the home team, away team, whatever. But you have these big massive arenas with nobody sitting in them or a very scant few people, according to other reports that was out about how they intend to play these games moving forward. We have absolutely no idea. All I can do is just be merely a a person that observes what's going to happen. But I know that if whether it be a certain amount of people in there or no people at all, the NFL is going to continue to get that money. Bottom line. Adebo says, without fans, we'll play like we do in the playoffs. Well, I'll tell you what, fans damn sure didn't help the Saints uh, in against the Minnesota Vikings in the Superdome last year because, boy, we were yelling our head off and – and it didn't make a lit spick a difference. So it didn't do a damn thing to help the Saints win. And the, the fans represented last year. And there was no, absolutely no help to the team because the team did not feed off the energy of the fan base who was excited and wanted revenge. You had everything it took to need it. You, got, you needed a revenge. You had a hated opponent 
that you got into your building, your fans showed up, and that's what kind of performance you turned out. That's why I was like, man, I ain't no way in the world, man. And then you stand up there when that, that's why I was really, I was going at Sean Payton hard because I know what I'm looking at. And I know what it, what it, what pe- most people look at and say, well, they won't see what you see, but it depends on what your, your perspective is, which, what, what you're looking at, what your lens and the optics from that game just didn't look right to me. It didn't sit right to me. And I was at war with Sean Payton from that point forward because I didn't like what I seem optically speaking. Everything was wrong about that, including the pres- the next week when you went on to be an analyst against uh, four, you know, the nation, uh, the network, when they were taking, when the 49ers were taking on the team you just lost to. And you're going to tell them how to beat that team? You tell me what kind of optics that is. All that looks wrong. It all looks wrong, which has me looking at you a little strange. And I'm going to keep my eyes on you really hard now. I'm really going to stand. That's just me doing that. I'm going to keep my eyes really hard on you now. Uh, let's see. Uh, Stunner says, what do you think we the Saints bigs? Oh, let's see. What do you think we Saints bigs need to get the ring? What the, the Saints need to get the ring? Do what they did in the regular season. And when you get to the playoffs, do not make, make mistakes. Play balanced football the way you know how to play. Don't make any, don't, I mean, penalties, false starts. Cut the miscues out. Catch the ball. No turnovers. That's what I'm saying. Discipline, smart football is what you need to win in the playoffs. It's not no monster. It's not the three-head monster, you know, of anything. It's just it's fundamental, smart football play. That's all. Don't turn the ball over. Don't throw interceptions. Do not get, you know, keep the penalties out of it. And then execute smart. Don't do all this, these uh plays where you trying to do this and all these flash plays. And keep it simple. Keep it simple and mix your playbook up. Stay balanced and 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 have at it. That's what I'm saying. The simplest stuff. We don't need all the fancy razzmatazz that he like to do and going for it on third downs and fourth. None of that. You know, that's that's how he get these guys motivated to play because the reality is they should have won it the last couple of years. We've been shooting ourselves in the foot and people can't seem to see if you look at their play that the Saints had to come from behind in many of these playoff games to have a chance to win them. You know, if either the offense is, is despondent to a degree, then they turn on, or the defense is allowing big plays, missed tackles, confusion all over the place. You studying this team, there's no way in the way you're supposed to know what they're going to do coming into the game and have the correct personnel in there to do what you need to do to win the game. And then above all, get to the quarterback. We need pressure to get to the quarterback and knock them around. And that's something that we didn't do last year. And you just let that man cut you up up in there. You there is it's not going to turn out good for you when you don't run the ball and when you don't get pressure on their quarterback. They were going to wear you out. And that's what they did. That's, that's what they did. Kirk Cousin wasn't a dude that was known to do that kind of stuff in the playoffs. He wasn't. But you turned him into Joe Montana. But how you played them. And that's what I'm saying. That's more on the Saints than it is on the Vikings. People could turn around and say, well, the Vikings outplayed, the, the Saints outplayed the Vikings. That's true to a degree. But look what the Saints, you've watched the Saints play for years. They were not in that game. They were not in that game until the fourth, the four minutes left in the game, which was absolutely ridiculous. The miscues is the problem, man. Stop the goddamn miscues and stop all the foolishness and operate with a balanced attack and hit and blitz those guys. Get I me mean, get the get the get the guys sack, get send some guys at them to knock the quarterback around, stop the run, one dimensionalize the guys. But above all, whatever you do to them, do to them, but don't do it to yourself. Do not create do not cause errors, do not cause penalties, do not have miscues, you know, make the tackle you're supposed to make, because everything's supposed to be ratcheted up threefold when you're in the playoffs especially attention to detail. And that's what it's about. And we have not exhibited that consistently in the playoffs. And that's why we've been getting run out the playoffs. You can't play sloppy football in the playoffs and think you're going to get lucky enough to sneak out a win. It's just not going to happen. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's keep it going here. Please hit the like button. Family, if you're in the stream, hit the like button. Uh, let's see. Let me see if the family members uh here. Uh, let's see. I'm... Okay, Derek says we deep on both sides of the line now. Can't say we are one injury away from being a trouble when it comes to our D line. D line is very deep. We are deep. Debo says what 
is what I ain't like the idea of people are going to disrespect those the season because of the pandemic. Whoever wins. Yeah, yeah, well, well, they can't never take it away from you. When the Saints win the Super Bowl, they say, well, y'all only did it because of this. Ah, that's fine. As long as I got it, I don't give a damn what they say. <laughs> and I'm going to keep it real with you. T. Dirty says, hey, Q, do you think the ref's going to screw us over this year? No doubt about it. Absolutely. They're going to try it again last year. They've been trying it. We've just been people smart enough to pay attention to it and to challenge it. You know, and I, that's why I'm saying it's like, I'm so proud and happy for the people because we ripping the veneer off of this shit. Pardon my French. Because if we're going to pay attention to it, we're going to spend time and effort and passion into it. You got to call it for what it is. And too far often when you have so many greedy bastards with their hands in the cookie jar with billions of dollars being passed out, lines being made on games and stuff like that. How they know this about, I mean, it's a, it's a certain amount of control aspect that if you're a thinking person, you have to look at it and say, yep, yeah, you're right, Q. But how do you beat that? All systems could be beat. All of them. They're not foolproof. All systems could be beat. And the Saints beat the system last year in the plus when the referees were trying to cheat them. They were able to get out ahead of teams and make the referees uh, invisible in the game. That's the same uh, process of thought that you have in the playoffs. You can remove NFL completely out of these games where they don't participate and have any impact or minimal impact on the game if you operate in the spirit of getting it done without any errors or you know what you're doing. That's all I'm saying, making it happen. Thank you for that, T-Dirty. Uh, DLP said, I agree with your Q. The NBA simply don't have this stuff together. I mean, my goodness, they're supposed to be smart. They're supposed to be all this. Man, you've been months and y'all still playing around, man. Either get it together or shut the goddamn thing down. Bubble cities and the players don't want to do it. Man, if you don't play, go sit your ass down over there. They are most of the players, people say they'll agree to the testing. They talking about testing them every day. If one guy gets tested for it and he's just watching watch, then he won't be in there for a week or two or whatever it is. So that's a portion of the climate where you're cutting people off and say, okay, if you get you can't be around your family members, it's a very very strange and weird ass world and i don't like it to the fact where i was watching something on tv the other day and we're on the computer and had this lady wanted to hug her mother for mother's day and she made some kind of plastic with arms wrapped in plastic where she can hug her mother and it got plastic here and she had to hug and and the lady didn't have nothing, and, and, and but it, she just it, hugging her in through plastic. That's just, it's just man, that that just happened, man. That just happened six, four, four or five months ago. That wasn't even a problem. But you got these older people out here, and they're susceptible to a lot of stuff, and. They're not helping them by scaring the hell out of them. You know, it's just, I don't like it, man. Michael, who that to you? Michael Rios, I see your family. Joshua says uh, the Minnesota game was a trap game. They overlooked the game. I don't know, Josh. I would I would not say that there is no way you can overlook Minnesota and call it a trap game because the Saints wanted revenge on the Minnesota Vikings. They were in their home. There was fit, really no way the Saints could have considered that a trap game being what they wanted. If they didn't get the Vardin honors, they wanted the Vikings for revenge at home for what happened two years prior to that. But what ended up happening was the Saints laid it down. You can't blame Minnesota for taking advantage because the Saints didn't come to play. And that's, that's, that's evidence by the tape there. I mean, interceptions, poor pass uh, blocking, poor run blocking, Defense, just ridiculous, garbage. You know, they were just pathetic. That's what it was. It was pathetic, and I was upset, and a portion of me still upset about it. T Dirty said, I think somebody should call for him. <laughs> oh, I hear you, T Dirty. Josh says, Big Q, do you see the NFL referee who blew the NFL no call was NFL referee of the past Super Bowl and called the PI on Kittle that stopped San Fran from scoring before the half? Yeah, he's a big, you know. But the ESPN called him the best referee. I'll call him. He was part of the best referee staff. And this dude blew an egregious call. He shouldn't even be a referee. But see, it's not on them. It's not them. I keep telling people 
that they getting in. They got communicators where they telling them not to do these calls. I'm telling you, people don't understand, but you pay attention to the game. You'll see what I see when they go to make calls in a re the review booths. They have an earpiece with a mic attachment to it. What you need a mic attachment for? You know, all the controls of the devices at your hand. Who are you talking to? And then you can see them mouthing and talking. Who are they talking to? And then the referee says that they, they at first they admitted that they didn't do it. Now they admitted last year they communicated them for them to get the call right. No, 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 no. They telling them which calls to make because they want that. These are control freak chump garbage at the top of these leagues that want to try to micromanage them. And very few of these calls that the referees are actually making are their calls. A lot of this stuff, like when the guy in the, in the Saints Rams playoff game, the one of the referees was running in with his hand to throw the flag, and then he was he took his hand off the flag. Why? How, how did he took offense? Because somebody told him not to. They got mic pieces, man, and that's why I keep telling people that's a way of manipulating the game. Just like I was telling people about Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan didn't just retire from the NFL, um, from the NBA because he was bored. No, he was about to face some charges. And they talked a little bit out on the special, but they bruised over it because, of course, even Dick Gregory knew that. Even Greg, Dick, Dick Gregory threw that about that. He knew that they, he was going to uh, face charges for point shaving. He was a gambler. He was a gambler. He was going. He was about to face some pain for them, paint, for them, them charges for point shaving. So what they did. He, he took a, a hiatus for a year or so. He was suspended secretly for a year. And the same stuff was about to happen to Magic Johnson. You can go and look this stuff up, do some research on it, but it's real, the real behind the game. That's what I'm talking about. And too often we looking at it like what it is, and it's not what it is, and very rarely it is what it is. So that's what I'm saying. A lot of this is not happening because of the referees because they're micromanaging control. They are. That's why they don't lose no money when they make bad calls. That's why they don't get suspended. That's why they don't get fired. You understand what I'm saying? Because they are merely appendages for some other sucker that's manipulating and controlling them. Hell, you know, they ain't even full time employees. You go, they're going to do whatever they, they, they bought them out and they sell their soul. Just a lot of just a lot of them people to do that. And you really shouldn't do that. You really don't need to even do that shit. All right, let's keep it going here. Debo says, I think the team were overconfident, like their coach, the home, more hungry team, one of the Packers would have, would have beat us. I think when you're dealing with how the Saints played in that game, I don't know what the logic was, but I knew that the coach wasn't there. I knew the coach wasn't there. When stuff was going to hell, he was way too calm. Even when the game was over and everybody was disappointed, disappointed including his team and the fan base, he was way too calm. He didn't blow no gaskets. That means after the game, none of it, just none of that. And that is suspect to me. And you could, and I know Sean Payton's a hothead. So you mean to tell me that you took that that well to the point where you was under control, where you was going up to shake Stefan Diggs hand and he motorbiking in your face and you didn't blow a gasket. That brings up question marks to me, man. That's a lot of question marks to me about the whole deal. I didn't like it. Uh, let's see. Eugene says, didn't you say last year we should have run the ball more? If so, how do we if we were dominated on both sides of the field against the Minnesota Vikings? You should. The, the reality is we should have ran the ball because the Saints have a better line than the Minnesota Vikings. But running the ball, it means whether you run it inside or out, you need to run the ball to create a balance. There is no if, fans, buts about it. You cannot allow your opponent to one dimensionalize your ass. So if you decide to run the ball, whether it's inside or out, you got to get it together. And I'm not saying run the ball. The Saints had the ability to run the ball, either whether they're going to use Kamara or use Latavius Murray or put a fullback in there to run the ball. The Saints should have, have been able to run the ball, even if they had to line up the tight ends and do a fullback or a power eye formation. They had to do something. Anytime you cycle your the inverted the defensive lineman, the, like the Minnesota Vikings did, they inverted the defensive lineman. Uh, which were Daniil Hunter and Everson Griffin to the interior line to create pressure up the middle. What do you do in that scenario? You tell me, Eugene. What do you do if Eugene Johnson, if they move Everson Griffin and uh, Daniil Hunter inside, what would be your call in that play? Huh? Do you and then run the ball at them then? That would be the weakness of that play, is if you run the ball at them where they have their pass rushes on the interior, That'll make them flip that shit around. But I'm saying there's ways that things should have been done that the Saints could have done that they didn't do. 
And Sean Payton was a little too pass happy like he usually is. And the team, he should have motivated them guys. But they wasn't, none of them was living up to the part. And I don't know what the hell was going on. But I know at the end of the day, they just didn't seem like they were into the game. And neither was he. But the Saint, the, the football, fundamental football, all I'm telling you is the same stuff that most of the, t- the best fundamental football coaches would tell you about running the ball to establish, establishing the run so you can throw the ball. Plays where you are going to play action without establishing the run, you are a fool. And that's what we've seen in that. Running plays without establishing a run, they're not, you're not going to fool anybody that way. The defense knows that you're not running the ball. They know it's a fake, it's a it's a, a, a play action fake for you to throw the ball, whatever. But there are for every play that you do, for whatever you do, that's a counter move and an effective counter move. I'm just telling you this basic fundamental stuff, man. The Saints should have ran the ball in the game and they had opportunities to run the ball. Even if you have to put a fullback in there and put your tight end package on the out there on the field to power eye and run the ball, the Saints could do that. They have a lot of ability to run the ball. It's not just putting Elvin Kamara in space and running them naked against a seven-man front. Come on. Like they did when they put him in third and one. He didn't have a fullback or nothing, and they met him in the backfield. Come on, man. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about intelligently running the ball, man. We know football, fam. Come on. And you know, that's that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Well, hold on. Let me keep up. Debo said the Vikings, 49ers, Packers would have beat us in the Dome in the playoffs. The way the Saints played in the Minnesota Vikings game, it, yeah, you're right. I don't think they could have beat any. You can't beat anybody playing like that. Uh, KT, who that tell you? Good to see you, fam. Uh, he says, Big Q, I turned the big 4-0 on Monday. All right. Thank you, fam. All right, full old Monday. Uh, happy birthday. Happy who that birthday to KT, the Southern gent. Good to hear that. 40 years old. That's a blessing, KT. Much love to you. And who that to your family? Happy birthday to you. Happy belated birthday. Uh, Debo says Packers got better in the playoffs. They were better than the Vikings. Vikings were the weakest team in the NFC side of the playoffs. As, as, as showed, they got annihilated by the 49ers the next week. Tyrone Jones, who that said the Saints have to play small football in the playoffs, change up in the playoffs. They have to, that's what it's about, not killing yourself in the playoffs, not committing miscues, not turning a goddamn ball over. It's not, it's not quantum physics or astrophysics. I mean, we know the, the chances are if you don't turn the ball over and you execute like you're supposed to execute, you're going to win the game. You let the other team make the mistakes and you capitalize off of it. And that's something that we just didn't do. We just, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Uh, But, you know, I agree. Hence why it was a trap game. They were focused on the next opponent. I don't know if it's a trap game, Josh. I hear, I hear your logic, but I don't know about it being a trap game. I don't know. Eugene said fans could not feed off of poor play. The fans were still yelling their ass off. (laughs) They still yelling their ass off. They drunk as hell up in there. They still was yelling their ass off, you know, and there was times when the fans like, come on, New Orleans, let's go, you know, and it was and people was doing away. People was trying to get the team. The team just didn't feed off of the energy that because the people were there and they were yelling. They were yelling. It was loud and, the, and they just didn't do it. They just didn't feed off the team. The team just didn't respond to that energy. Sometimes you're supposed to feed off of that energy. Uh, let's see. Uh, yep, I agree with Eugene. Eugene said we couldn't stop nothing in that game. That's right. I agree. KT says chilling family allergies were messing up with me on Monday, so I'm slipping and celebrating. Debo says the Saints play below their play grade. I got discussed at AK the Falcon game, 49ers game. Uh, Josh says Peyton has got to get better at in game adjustments. Yes. Uh, Tramal says Peyton is a failure if he can't win with this roster. Debo says low key we're we're rooting for other teams to get us a buy and a plus. We just play soft as baby pool and we looked around lost. Yeah, we when we lost to the Forty Niners, it put us in a in a bad boat. And we could have beat the Niners. We lost to the Niners in a in a really really messed up fashion. You know, we didn't make the plays. We were supposed to. If, if a tackle was made on Kittle's game over with. Then it was compound by the fact Marcus Williams caught up with him, didn't tackle him, grabbed his face mask for 10 yards, gave him extra penalties to get him clo- extra yardage on top of the penalty to get him close for a game winning field goal. 
That's what I'm talking about. Dumbass miscues like that compounded over and over again in serious game situations can't happen. Smart teams don't make dumb, don't make bad decisions. Like, you know, don't get me wrong. Teams make mistakes, but they don't make mistakes in crucial times like that to hurt themselves. That was stupid. Grabbing the man face mask and basically escorting him down the field until the referees called a face mask penalty, which basically helped one of the best kickers in the league kick a field goal to win the game. You can't do that. You cannot do that kind of stuff. And that's how you lost the 49ers game. Then you was praying that they would lose and they never lost. Then you, then they could not beat the team that they were in front of. It's just what it is. All right, let's keep it going here. Uh, Debo says Kamara couldn't do Jack. Josh says, Big Q, do you go out and hit up the social media to try to influence some of the players? We want to try to get them on the Great Saints Thank Tank. Not me in particular. Every now and again, I go in there. But there are other people that's involved in the, that work with the PRO Media Network. They do a lot of social media work and outreach to guys. That's how we able to get different people on and got people lined up coming on down the line. So it's not particularly me all the time. I do reach out and engage people when I have the time to do it because I'm kind of I, I have time restraints myself, family and otherwise. And it's just, a, you know, I do have other people that work with me. But don't get me wrong. When I'm on social media, I do reach out uh to people and communicate with people i do my best you know what i'm saying thank you for that willis says right the referees will try it again no doubt about it Derek said they eliminated the pi review that lasted all for three seconds i, I knew it i t- and i said it when it happened that is you're taking a power you're giving power to the people that's the problem the the rule wasn't the problem the, fr- the fact that the man didn't make the call was the problem not the rule so see once again is misdirection we're going to change this and that been and I, and I said taking and giving them more power to rule don't help it. You got to take it out of their hands and put it into an independent hand that ain't got nothing to do with them. Then you'll see a change. More than likely they don't want to do that because they even though you change it they won't still hold the control of it. And I told you it wasn't going to make no difference cuz a lot of the calls didn't help, help help anyway. So I mean you got to take it out of the hands of the referees they're incompetent. They're incompetent. they're incompetent and they're incompetent because the people above them want them to be incompetent because if something go wrong, the first person you blame is them and it's supposed to stay with them because they're the representative. They appear to be the people that's making the call. So if something happens, you blame the referee as opposed to being the construct that manipulates the control of the referee. See, it stays at that level. That's why they're never disciplined. They're never fired. They're never kicked out. The nuts never done at them because that's where the heat is supposed to stay at the referee level. You're not supposed to go up to the NFL and says, hold on. What do you let's open the record books here and see exactly what you're doing here. What's the deal with that? When the lawsuits start flying about the whole deal, the NFL got nervous. So it started using this little influence. And they have a lot of people up on the federal level that they use to influence. And a lot of those lawsuits were shut down. One lawsuit from a guy in Mandeville, Louisiana, carried on because it was below a certain financial uh, threshold where it didn't warrant that federal, uh, uh, I guess, uh, for lack of better words, observation. So it had an opportunity to exist. And he himself then pulled it back. I don't know why, because you had a clear chance to be able to have the commissioner come in, open the books and have him question. And you could have had some books open and look in and they don't want you looking in them books. They don't want you to look at what they're really doing over there, because a lot of it's not any have nothing to do with football. It's a lot of entertainment and a lot of politics behind it. So they don't want you to look behind them, that curtain there. They don't want you to see that man behind that curtain there. He pulled it back because he said it wasn't be a distraction to the team. And my response to that is what is that? How would your pitlin ass lawsuit have anything to be the distraction to a team that's supposed to be a Super Bowl team? They don't deserve to go to the Super Bowl if they worried about a lawsuit. So, I mean, it's just it's a lot of nonsense. But, you know, sooner or later, the truth to come out and it slowly have been coming out. And you're going to learn more as time comes because that's the time we're in. Josh, I saw that, but it's only so the refs don't get looked at closely to show how much and how many times a game they actually mess up. They are really incompetent. Josh says, I think about it, Q. It was a trap game because the Saints overlooked them and expected them to win, a.k.a. a trap game. Okay, I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. I just it's hard in my head to, to know that the Saints should have known to take this team apart. They had all the everything you possibly could have had in your hands, all of the the frustrations, because this team, you played them a couple years back. They won in a, in a fashion that stuck with you, and you should have avenged it. That's such thing as avenging shit. They didn't avenge nothing. They just took it like chumps, you know, and it's it's a shame, man. 
Uh, let's see. Josh was a thank you. Q. It's, uh, KT says, Big Q, do you think, uh, do you have as a surprise veteran cut before the season starts? Who do you have as a surprise veteran cut before the season starts? I don't have one, um, KT. Not yet, bro. It's still very early on. But if you mention it like a starter uh, cut or like a veteran that's, that we thinking about making a team that don't make it, perhaps a P.J. Robinson, maybe a Nick Easton or something like that. If you're talking about a starter, I don't see one. I don't see one that that would be cut, you know, uh, something like that. But I can look at a couple of guys right now that said they could be on a chopping block. Nick Easton could be on a chopping back block as well as uh, Robinson, who could be, be as well. But Nick Easton gets my vote. Uh, if you're not talking about starters, you're just talking about regular guys. Uh, Willie says, I feel like I saw a game looks like, I feel like this, I saw the game looks like to me as, as to me, they was in it. Was it in the game? I, damn, I'm screwing that all up. I feel like this, I saw the game looks like to me, they was it in the game. Okay. DLP, uh, Dominic says, that's true, Q. The Mafia guy talk about making Michael Shea point on the court and NFL on Mike Tyson Hot Box Podcast. It's very much true. It's always, it's the game behind the game. That's what the people tell you is the game behind the game. Like, you know, it's 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 how the, how, it's, how the world ran. You, re, you think it's this guy running it, but really it's a guy that behind the scenes that you know didn't even exist that's operating. You know, that's how they operate. That's how they think. That's how they run stuff. That's how they control stuff. And when we get that understanding of that's how things work, we can be competitors in this whole thing and not just merely people speculating or spectating. You know, we could be able to participate at that level. But we understand. But it's two different or multiple different vantage points of how the world is. And it's how the world actually is and how people seem to color it. And they're not coloring it because that's what they want it to be. Somebody gave them that and said, this is what it is. And it's not like that at all. And it's up to you to find out what it is. And then when stuff like this happen, it start bringing what you think it is, your construct down, or then you start feeling like the walls are closing in on you. But no, that's the construct that you was living in. That's not real. And when you reach and learn what the truth is, is empowering. And it gives you the correct information to make the right moves and create the right stratagem to then empower you because the construct is not empowering. It's a slave construct. It's an artificial construct that's meant to depower you, empower somebody else. Think about it. Like we talk about sports here, how, you know, the money that we give to the, NF to the Saints or any other of these teams, do they give it back to you? How do they then empower you back? your investment in them. Are you just doing this strictly for entertainment? It's more to that to you because it was created to, for you to think that way. But inside of it, what do, do they then turn back and give back to you? What do they give back? Do they give you free tickets? Do they give you, I mean, you see what I'm saying? It's a one-sided deal empowerment that empowers one side. That's the construct. So once we then realize what it is and come up out of it, we can get empowerment as well because that's how a lot of these people are making it out here anyway playing that game and talking to you a certain way like you a child when you have better sense than they do you just got to call them out uh dominic said that's true uh, let's see joshua says we got to run the ball it allows actions to uh actions to work joshua says you run right at them and let your center guards pancake the defensive ends thank you joshua for that that's the question i opened early. oh i asked early on when they invert the defensive ends to the interior of the line what everson and griffin did with Daniel Hunter, that's when you pound them with that running attack up the center, because we know that that play defensively was called to provide pass rush, to provide pressure up the center that way. But if you had your run effect in there and the guards was running, they would mush those guys to hell. And that's why I was saying about being smart when you make plays. So sometimes you're looking at what they do. You can then audible into the correct play to help yourself have more success. It's like checkers. Um, well, actually, chess. You know, seeing what your opponent do and then making the correct move. Thank you, fam, on that. All right, let's keep it going here. Um, Carlito. Hold on, fam. Give me just a second. I'm getting flash flood warnings. Tornado warnings on my phone. 
All right, uh, let's keep it. Uh, 95 Law says they were trying to run to the outside since the DE was on the inside, but it didn't work like that stupid third and one. A lot of suspect calls. Carlito, who that to you? Joshua says, but we wish y'all the best. Got to take off. Y'all have a great night. All right, Josh, much love to you. 95 says, happy birthday. Big up to you, KT. Uh, Derek says, I'm glad we signed Sanders, but I hear him talk about we're going to be a pass happy team one more time. I'm going to blow a gasket. I don't think that the, that I just don't think that's going to happen. Family. I'm sorry. I, I got to agree with the run balance because you can't just throw it around like that because that don't get you nowhere. You got to have you. We know you can wing it. You switch up the offensive line so that you can run the ball. You can better protect drew. But a part of that is they have to run the ball in the interior. Again, they have to be able to do that. They have to be able to utilize the fullback. I didn't tell them to keep a fullback on the team. They keeps fullback so that they could run the, hopefully use the power eye formations and the interior running plays that can help move the needle. A fullback helps. He really does. He helps take out one block and helps get your running back to the second and perhaps if he's good enough to get to the third levels and beyond. So that's what it come down to. They have to utilize the correct personnel in these situations to help them win the game. It's, it's, it's just common football stuff. You know what I'm saying, fam? KT says, Big Q, why did we bring back Carr? I feel like Drew picks and chooses players to keep on the team. Our receiver court could have Mike Thomas, Cooks, and Kenny Stills, but Ego got involved. A lot of stuff involved Mike Thomas and Cooks. That If, if Cooks would have not got really – you know, into it with Thomas, he probably would end up leaving anyway because I know he wanted a fat contract and he wanted to be the man. So that didn't work. The Kenny Steele things was inside baseball, something tied to Vinny, uh, Kenny Baccaro. I won't get into it, but those who know know what I'm talking about. But the Austin Carr situation, that's it. I keep telling people over and over again about Austin Carr is that Austin Carr is a smart dude. And prayers to Austin Carr, whose wife is dealing with the virus right now. It was announced on social media. So big ups to Austin Carr and blessings and prayers out to him and his family members as they're going through it right now with the virus. So big ups to Austin Carr. But I really think the reason why Austin Carr is back is because the Saints are comfortable with Austin Carr, that he can catch the ball. He's a pretty damn good slot man. If you give him an opportunity, he knows how to find those little holes to hide in. He's he's gained the trust of Sean Payton. He's gained the trust of Drew Brees. His issues have been injury. So he's a low, a low cost signing that can help the team in many ways. So I wouldn't accept, you know, get too upset with Austin Carr. I think Austin Carr will have an opportunity to make the team. We'll see, you know, because he could do different things. He plays special teams, but he always finds a way to make it onto the roster. And he's not the fastest guy, not the biggest guy, not the best catcher, but he's a hardworking dude that earned the respect of his coaches and players around him. And he always finds a way to stick and stay. And that's just the gift that he has. Um, let's see. Let's keep it going. Debo says, man, the P.I. call in the 49ers and Seahawks game was the worst call ever. I remember that. It's suspect. That's what I'm saying. And Edible Expertise, who that to you? says, what do you think about making a super wild card? That would mean they could host a playoff game if they had a better record than the second, third, fourth seed division winner. Interesting concept. Interesting concept. You know, if and I wouldn't be against anything to get if they're in the playoffs. If you speaking of the Saints and the having a super wild card game or whatever, that's fine. If the Saints are in the playoffs, I think they're a danger to anybody there, especially if they're playing balanced football and keeping their wits about them. I think that'll be fine. Uh, let's see, Laura's oh, Laura, who that to you, Laura? Good to see you there in the building. Debo says he deserves every penny he put. See you on his back for years and never hurt. Uh, super Bowl bound this year. Thank you, Laura. Who that to you? Uh, Debo says <laughs> cut Trey Quine. They're gonna still hold on to him, Debo. Uh, Robinson can go with LL and L back, uh, bring Eli back cheaper. I keep hearing that. We will see Ramsey. Who that Ramsey said, what up big Q waiting all day for your show. All right. Thank you. Ramsey. Appreciate your family for chiming in. Uh, Stefan, who that to your family. Good to see you. Stefan. Laura says PJ Williams and Patrick Robinson need to go. Debo says PJ is the waste of roster spot. If he, if he can't start, don't keep him. He's not even good at nickel. No, I'm I'm hoping that they're looking at him as a safety. That's what I'm thinking. Hopefully, it's a safety. A lot of competition at the cornerback position. Hopefully, they're looking at him as a safety. But I agree with you. I don't want him as a corner. Uh, <laughs> Lori says, save money, trash. Dominic says, I agree with uh, them two got to go. Stephon says, nothing, nothing much. 
Okay, Debo says Saints fullbacks are glorified tight ends, which works because you can use them in that package as well. If you having a problem with the tight end, you can slide them out. And that's the that's the the multiplicity angle I like with having guys that can do that because if you line them up here, you kind of fool the defense the defense a bit. You can line them back here. And remember, the Saints operated a pretty wicked tight end package some seasons ago when they had their three tight ends. They could they'll run out of it, they'll pass out of it. It was really no way. It was very effective. When they did the three tight end package in the red zone, they had guys going this way, going it, and then you they were good catchers of the ball as well as good blockers. So the Saints could run Arthur out of it, and it really confused teams, and they were really effective at it. They just went away from it, you know, because they didn't have the personnel to, to run some of these plays, and I think that's a portion of it too. You got to have the personnel to effectively run some of these plays. Just imagine if they had a, a back with similar capabilities as a Darren Sproles, some of the plays that Darren used to run they used to have in his in his in his uh in his playbook for a Darren Sproles type of back. If you had a Darren Sproles type of back, you can kind of bring some of those plays back. And I'm pretty sure they do use some of those for Elvin Kamara. But what I'm saying is if you can have another back that can do similarly things to what with a guy like Kamara can do and you can have both of them at the same time, you can really cause problems for the defense because you don't know which way they're gonna come. You don't know if Elvin's gonna run or he's is he gonna be a wide receiver. You really don't know. And it could cause kind of play games, really play games with the defensive coordinator. Just some food for thought. But the Saints had a lot, a lot of interesting packages that they were known for when they were really running it. Who that to you, Slick Rick? Good to see you in the chat. And Edible says, I'll take steals back any day. Horrible. I hope any day. Hopefully, Drew likes his work ethic now more than before. Uh, Laura says, Car's a waste. <laughs> Carl was bought back to help with insurance for his family. Uh, but prayers for him and his family. Thanks. Derek says, I think because of competition, every player that was a disappointment will step it up this year. Traquan Carr, et cetera. I'm expecting upturns and a lot because Traquan Smith in this year, a lot of people expected him to show up. He has to turn it up. This is the year where a lot of his, 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 his length have run out and he has to show up or be shown out. So a lot of players are definitely going to feel that intense pressure, that intense burden to show up unlike ever before. So I'm anticipating a lot of that to happen with guys like Traquan Smith, who hasn't lived up to the expectation that he was supposed to live up to, even though the fact that he might have been in situations where he wasn't comfortable playing in the slot. And likewise, you know, even though he's a, a deep wide receiver guy that plays on outside, he's not accustomed to playing inside that much. And that's not what he does. But even if you do play that, you've got to be able to make the play. When you're on the field, being that you have a limited amount of of, of reputations anyway, you got to make an impact on the field when you get a chance to play. Common sense to a lot of people. KT says, uh, Big Q, do you think the light goes off this year for Marcus Davenport? Also, you give Jameis a legitimate chance as an heir to an uh, heir apparent. Uh, the light goes on for Marcus Davenport. Um, Davenport, to me, uh, is a guy that, showed you incrementally from the first of the second year that he needs to refine his technique. So he has to work on his technique a little bit better. He, a lot of what he does is he gets away with it because of he's, he's purely athletic, you know, but he definitely have to work on his technique more. He has to kind of beat that injury bug and be able to make it to and stay on the field. But I think a lot of it has to happen with coach Payton and how they then mix their situational pass rusher with Davenport to kind of, kind of, I say kind of work him slowly back into the rotation. You know, you have to work him slowly into the rotation, in my opinion. But I don't think he's a bust. I think he'll start learning. You'll see a lot more from him. He just got to see. He just has to stay on the field, man. He has to stay on the field. He has to stay on the field. That's that's what, He has to be able to beat these injuries and stay on the field. That's the only way he'll develop into what we know he could be. Because you've seen glimpses of, glimpses of him the first couple of years. But now, man, you know, the injury bug is the thing that's kind of kind of keeping Marcus down. But when he beats that bug, you're going to really see some sports out of him. But I was hoping that the Saints bring in a veteran guy to take that pressure off of him. And so he can play the situational pass rusher so that he can be able to be come in e effectively and build that confidence up and learn and go from there. You know, I, I, maybe we jump through him in there a little too early, you know. That's why I was advocating for Everson Griffin, Marcus Golden, someone like that to kind of take that pressure, let him fall back to the situational role and work his way slowly back in there, being that he's coming off for two years worth of injuries. It's a fool for thought. So 
I think he'll definitely get better about that light going on. It depends on his, his if he can work his way through the injuries and the light will come on for him eventually if he can stay healthy because he has what it takes. He got to work on a few of his moves, but the guy has what it takes. He just got to be on the field. And about Jameis Winston question, KT, I think he could be a legitimate heir based upon what he does this year. Uh, with the team. Now, of course, he's not the man. He got to sit behind Drew. He's going to learn just like Teddy did, just like Taysom did. And a lot of quarterbacks that smart that sit behind Drew, they're going to learn the 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 routine aspect of it that takes them to another level. That's what it comes down to. Anything else, the Saints are not going to tolerate. But if he sits behind them and learn, then he should be uh, – he will definitely come back next year with an opportunity to take on that heir apparent uh, tag. Because the Saints wouldn't have brought him in here 26 years of age for a million bucks or whatever it is, just over a million, to, to be a possible backup to Drew, a cheap backup to Drew for one year. They could see Winston as a guy that can actually go ahead. And I remember he's a former first-round draft pick five years ago. He's 26 years old in the prime of his career. He gets some tools from, from Drew Brees and gets the routine down. He can be fantastic and a cheap option and apparent for the Saints moving ahead in the NFC South and the rest of the NFL. So, I mean, I would definitely say that it's possibility on Jameis Winston. The Saints could definitely see him as an heir apparent. And the truth be told, he has a lot more skill in turn of being a quarterback than Taysom Hill. He's a real threat against Taysom Hill's uh, prospects of becoming an heir apparent. No doubt about it. No doubt about it in my book. You don't go get a 26-year-old former first-round overall quarterback in a draft to compete with a guy that just threw 13 passes last year. I mean, the optics, man. It's about optics. 985 says Sean Payton didn't bust any fire extinguishers after the game or before he was too happy uh, on that Prozac. Uh, Okula McGee, who that to you? Larry Williams, who that to you? Willie Mitchell says, I agree, Larry. Who that? De Debo says, Trick on has regressed every year since his rookie year. Can't argue with you on that, Debo. You're right. Ramsey says, Q, is there another time frame when teams sign free agents? No, I think it, there's they, people consider the first portion of free agency, the second portion, the second layer, then the third. And we into the deep aspects of free agency in which you have people that's left over and it just goes like that. So I think right now is a, a good time to go get veterans, really good veterans for next to nothing. And you can kind of get them down on a price, uh, which you asked for them because the draft has happened. People basically feel a lot of their wants. And it's just basically cleanup duty. So you can get a good veteran right now on free agency uh, for next to nothing and get them on the team. So a lot of veterans, if they want to play, they will take a one-year deal to play for a contender and then try the free agency again next year. That's the, the mind frame. You're not going to get blood from a tournament because most of the money's already gone. Most of the teams didn't hire who they wanted. They done got you know they got to sign their draft picks. So the, the majority of the money that you was looking for at the start of free agency is gone. That's all out of here. So the next thing is, if I was Everson Griffin or Go, uh, Golden and these guys, I'll take a one-year deal with a contender and then bounce back to free agency next year. That just to keep it real with you. All right, Debo says we got to get on Sheldon Rankin's ass. LOL, he was ghost last year. Shuttle, Stuttle, sh uh, uh, Shy Tuttle outplayed him. That's uh, well, he that was stuff about Sheldon Rankin's not being totally healthy. But he's supposed to be healthy now, so we'll see how it goes, man. Larry says, even my partner, little bro, Rico, gathers. Okay, Jesse Jackson, who that to you, Jesse? If the Saints didn't let Ingram go, would CSP do what he did this season? Hard to say, man. Hard to say. I think he would still run the ball. I think he would be more of a balanced attack like they were before. He knew how to use those guys. I don't think he knows quite how to use uh, uh, Latavius Murray and Elvin Kamara together. I don't think he sees them as a tandem like that. You know, he sees Kamara as a featured back and then Latavius fills in for him. That's how I think it is. And that's based purely upon how he plays them in these games. Because it's not even close to what it was when he was running Ingram and Kamara in and out of these packages. He really knew how to use them uh, to guys together in, in concert. Now I don't think he sees those, the Latavius uh, Murray and Elvin Kamara uh, tandem as a Ingram Kamara tandem. It's not the same. It's more of Kamara as the feature back, Ingram as a uh, as a fill in guy or a change of pace back or to give him some rest or whenever. You see what I'm saying? I don't th I don't see they have the but if Ingram was here, it'd definitely be a different thing because they would be running the ball a little bit better what they're doing. Okay, Stephon, who that T says hope he can stay healthy. Derek says who that fam. 
Uh, Larry says, Ar Ar uh, Arnold ain't better than Gathers. Willis says, that's right, Big Q. And Neville the T says, yep, Mark should still be here. Ernest Adams Jr., who that T says, Ingram uh, fared a whole lot better with the Ravens, though, because they used him as the featured back. And that's what he wanted. He wanted to be the back. He wanted to be the man, you know, and they gave him the ball uh, and let him be the man. And he had a lot of, uh, he had a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, success there. And it helps when you have a quarterback that can throw the ball around and good weapons around where you can move around. It helps out when you can run the ball and pass the ball and you have a quarterback that's a running threat too. He's a two-way threat as well. So it really helped the Ravens. It was a good place for Ingram to end up. Uh, Derek says, as, as, they, as soon as they open the facility again, we can get some free agents and well do at least one more splash. Ray, uh, inevitable XT says Ravens are a run based team. That's why Debo says Malcolm Brown was the interior lineman MVP last year. Get that man his props. Big, big, big signing. Always gave Malcolm Brown big props. They were been trying to get rid of Tyler Davidson. They finally did it where well, they picked up Mark Malcolm Brown and he's been excellent. He's the reason why the Saints are a top five, a top four, uh, against the running, uh, Russia, uh, Russia of, any, of other opposing teams. They're number four ranked. Because of Malcolm Brown, David Onyemata, Sheldon Rankin, Shy Tuttle, Taylor Stallworth, and, and, and on and on and on. Just talking about the interior of the defensive line. KT says, Big Q, I'm really liking the Troutman and Zach Bond picks. I'm feeling like we are adding more young cornerstones for our team. Just a thought, wishful thinking, we draft Ohio State's quarterback. Uh, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to get uh, him next year. Uh, if the Saints have to be very bad to, to get to get Justin Fields, uh, I, I don't I don't see that happening. I think probably the Saints will probably look at a guy like Jameis Winston. I don't know if they feel comfortable with having a stalk rookie there. I mean, Sean Payton might like the Jameis Winston option better. He's been in the league for five years. He's been through it. He's been time tested. Just clean up his discipline bit and his vision or what have you, and see where that goes. But we're going to see next year how it goes, man. But interesting. Thank you for that, uh, KT. Uh, Travis Daisy, who that to you, says, Davenport need game reps to tighten up his craft. Rankins got hurt the last two seasons. A dog, when healthy, could be, he could, healthy, he could be, he be cut. He says, he a uh, dog, when healthy, could he be cut? No, I don't think Sheldon Rankins gets cut. I think he fills out his entire time with the Saints, but the David Onyemata signing is not good news for Sheldon Rankins. With his multiple injuries, David Onyemata has outperformed him uh, and been pushing him ever since that he's been here. David Onyemata has really been pushing Sheldon Rankins uh, to take his position away, and it's been unfortunate because this guy, Onyemata, was extremely raw, and he's worked his ass off and got to a position where he got paid before Sheldon Rankins. So it's not good that they gave him money. I don't know if they'll turn around and give Sheldon Rankins the money. The likelihood that he probably won't, but I don't see him getting cut. So, uh, but Davenport definitely need the reps to, to kind of get better. I agree with you. Thank you, Travis. Um, Ernest says, uh, peanut butter with no jelly. Ramsey, AQ, what with a lot of teams changing uniforms, do you think the Saints will make any changes too? I haven't anticipated that. I haven't heard anything. Uh, about the Saints changing their uniforms. Larry says, I want the old, the whole uniforms back, the old uniforms back. I haven't heard anything about it as of right now, but that don't mean necessarily that they won't be something that they'll, you know, that won't come out later on. We just have to keep an eye on it. Thank you, Ramsey. Uh, Debo says, Mark Ingram could, but I pick Kamara every day over Marky Mark. Inevitable XT says, I like to spread my meal and jelly with a spoon. At you. What y'all talking about, man? <laughs> All right, family. Well, family, I, I, I love it. KT says, how sick would it be if the Saints wore all black with a black helmet? I know that that'd be, that will be cold. I seen somebody had a mock black Saints helmet on, all black, with the floor of the leaf was traced in white. The floor of the leaf was actually black with a, out, with a white layer around it, an outline around it. And I was like, man, that's pretty nice. Uh, but, you know, traditionally, they're going to rock that black and gold. But having an all black uniform wouldn't be a bad look. That actually be pretty nice, but we'll just see. Uh, Debo says we need some personality on defensive side, and no, not my boy Sleepy Lattimore. Le Jenkins is uh, Malcolm Jenkins is back there. A full season of uh, play, uh, camp with Janoris Jenkins there, and Malcolm Jenkins. It speaks. You talk about two really good defensive backs, 
And Malcolm Jenkins is still very productive. He still he, he knows this defense. And then Janoris Jenkins is still very good as well. And Chauncey going to Johnson in a slot. So like I said, it's a lot of really great things that's going to go on. And I think eventually, you know, you can see the Saints uh, relying on the defensive end, but they're getting instruction from some of the veteran guys like Malcolm Jenkins, Janoris Jenkins, uh, DJ Swearinger is there as well to help a lot of the young guys in the backfield develop. And the case in the linebacker court with Demario Davis and Alex Anzalone teaching guys like Cade Nellis and Jack uh, Bashy, those guys how to play the position, these young athletic linebackers, and the same on the defensive line and everywhere else on the team. So it's just one of those things that the 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 Saints realizing that the veteran aspect of it goes to help the team out exponentially. Uh, Jesse says Saints cannot pluck a cornerback with Jabari uh, Greer's tangible. He was a free agent. Iceman, what up, Iceman? Good to see you in the chat as well. Much love to Iceman the rest of the teams joining in. Please hit the like button, family. But well, family, we're getting close to the end of the show. I'd like to thank everybody for joining the Sports Coma tonight. Uh, once again, appreciate the family for dropping in, tuning in with the team tonight as we covered some of the latest news. We talked about the acquisition of uh, offensive lineman Patrick Omame who ultimately came back, does it spell bad news for Nick Easton? I would say so it does. Five million, renegotiate, or uh, simply get rid, rid of Nick Easton, who I thought the Saints kind of had a knee-jerk reaction of signing anyway. You know, so he makes five million, and, and if you get rid of a guy who won three straight, who went to three straight uh, Pro Bowls for seven or eight million dollars, why won't you get rid of an expensive backup for five million? We know Omar May's contract is going to be super cheap, and you have several other players that do what he do. Why would you keep a five million dollar a reserve? It just on the offensive line. It don't. It does not compute. Does not compute. Does not compute. And he's he should feel the uh, the X or the blade pretty soon as well. Heavy C Anderson, what up, Heavy C? Good to see you in the chat as well. Uh, but that's a portion of the game, man, that people have to realize as well. Now we get to pause to to the portion of the show, family, where. I'd like to give a shout out to all the family members for joining us here in the stream. And as usual, if you want to listen to the shows, and that's all the shows, the Sports Coma, Pelican Post Game Report, Ring King Boxing, World, and Tough Tiger Talk are all available on uh, the Pro Media Network's radio or Pro Radio. That's Spreaker.com slash the Sports Coma. All the video and art is all available in audio format. You can listen to at work or when you're on the road moving around. Pro Radio is here. Then, of course, to let the family members know that to become a part of the show or the platform to help promote the show, you can easily go to patreon.com slash the PRO Media Network and sign up to join to become a patron of the show. And with that, you get access to extra shows like TSC Live, TSC Q&A Live. Every Tuesday, we have a shows tied in unlock content as well access to the latest videos that's coming out as well pro media network uh is the platform if you love it man support support the platform by becoming a patron patreon.com slash pro media network the link in the, is in the description section and of course we're looking at the pro shop if you guys are interested in getting some really good gear to help promote and keep the platform going strong and you look good you represent and look stylish check out the pro shop the link is in the description section below and right now you can get 15 percent off we're offering at the time of purchase it's called stay strong with the product code stay strong and of course teespring then gives you another 10 percent for signing up for text alerts so you can have 10 for 10 percent from teespring 15 from us equals 25 percent off 25 percent off how about that so check out the pro shop man link in the description section below a lot of great gear is available there so once again i'd like to thank all the beautiful black and gold family members for joining us tonight on the sports coma uh show and let's remember family we'll be back on saturday well, more great content. We'll work on getting a, a guest. I think Bob Rose will be available. We still negotiating with Bob Rose to get him on the show, working his schedule. So we should have Bob back to talk Saints with us as well uh, this upcoming Saturday show. So 
uh please join us then please hit the like button family please subscribe if you aren't a subscriber as we continue to move forward family as we continue to move forward so i thank y'all appreciate y'all for joining us on tonight's show i love y'all appreciate y'all peace and who that yeah well all right like you always say welcome 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 Number one sports talking D. Uh, we ain't like the Falcons. We won't blow the lead. Look, all we talk is who that? Uh, who got cut and who back? Uh, Rookies in the vets. Uh, players you should look at. Yeah. It's the sports coma. You don't want to miss it. Got the pre game, party, post game statistics. Get a visit for Sway. Maybe DC or Five. It's the hottest thing smoking. Big Q in the guys. Go to YouTube and live. Make sure you subscribe. In the views inside the Saints locker room. High. Talk to Drew. Jordan, Zach, Peyton, uh, New Orleans, who that nation? Uh, Best believe when I say we be gold and black. Ain't a miracle or robbery could ever hold us back. No, Beast Quake, Bounty Gate, let the truth be told. It's the sports coma, all we know is say Super Bowl. Yeah.